Hi, this is Ted Price from Insomniac Games, and on today's episode of the Game Maker's Notebook, I had the distinct pleasure of talking to one of my favorite people in the industry, Phil Spencer. Phil is known by gamers, developers, and publishers alike as one of the most accessible people in the industry. He's always online, he's always available to play games with you if he knows you or not, which is one of the things that we all love about him. But he was also today willing to open up about many of the things that Microsoft is doing to advance the industry. We talked about the xCloud, we talked about monetization, we talked about culture within Microsoft and its studios. But more importantly, we talked about how the industry can be sharing information more within the industry and externally as we become more transparent to players and to potential developers who want to join us. One of my favorite topics we discussed was accessibility, not just with game design, but in hardware design and its importance to a broader and differently abled audience. Please join us for a fantastic episode. Welcome to the Game Makers Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Makers Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Phil, it is fantastic to have you on the show. Thanks, Ted. And uh, we're here at DICE 2020, and we were just talking about Dungeons and Dragons. (laughs) Don't we always? That's always our topic. It's kind of funny. It seems like when we all talk about how we got into the industry, at least from the people I talk to, Dungeons and Dragons always has some sort of connection to their their inspiration for games. Uh, did you play as a kid? I did. You know, I remember uh, my introduction to it. I was on a camp out um, as part of this YMCA thing that my family did. And um, there was an older kid there who introduced me to Dungeons and Dragons. He didn't have anything. You know, he didn't have a dungeon. He didn't so he, we basically had a blank white piece of paper and we went through a first dungeon. There were like three kids. I was probably seven or something. And, um, he was probably 12. Uh, and it was just very intriguing to me that he was making up this kind of story as we were going along and we had some kind of you know capability to impact what was going on. And yeah, that interactive loop, even at that early uh, age kind of set, set with me. Was that before you had started playing video games? Uh, it would have been, yeah, because uh, the first time I ever played a video game uh, was my dad brought home a, a Pong machine, and um, I was showing how old I am. But the, uh, which you know, for me, the connection between those two things um, was was wasn't automatic for me, and it, it's always been a thing for me with video games, actually. That because I, I started playing video games when video games were really uh, an exercise of skill. Right. How could I, the Pong machine that we first had, had three controllers. So one, they had kind of an X and a Y. Um, and then you had this third knob you could spin to actually control the ball in certain modes after you'd hit it. And I, but um, but it was how good could I get at controlling, at playing whatever it was, tennis or hockey or the different modes of the games that they had. And then there was this whole other thing of reading and comics and kind of world building. Um, and it was a while before those two things actually came together in my head. Because like I said, to me, video games based on arcades and other things were more about skill and, and the kind of capability levels. Um, and, but like, you know, the first time those two things come together, it's pretty magical. Do you remember the first time you played a game that had story content? Um, so I, I think as soon as, uh, because of my love of kind of fantasy and, uh, that setting, as soon as like the Ultima games came out, um, the old gold box games, because it was just a natural overlap. I was curious, you know, what is it going to mean? I remember even going to my local uh, D&D shop when these games were coming out. And of course, those games, at least where I lived, which was down in Southern California, um, there were computer stores that would have the video games. And then there were board game shops that would have the D&D wall with the dungeons. And um, they weren't, they were different places. And I, I'd even say in where I was, there was maybe a little bit of an antagonism between the things. So that's not really Dungeons and Dragons playing on a, on a computer. You need a real DM to actually go through. Um, but those games were really the first times where I, I kind of saw the capability, the fantasy games and stuff that came together. Um, and, and it was a hook, like for me, it just really worked. 
um, the ability to go and, and find worlds and characters and build on them. And, um, but I, I, I still kind of, in some ways, segment gameplay in my head and teams that I've worked with for a long time know this. I'll ask, like, what's my skill loop? What am I good at in the beginning that I'm amazing at after I played for five hours? And how does that help me progress in the game? Um, and in addition, there's usually a world evolution that's going on around me of the story and the characters as they evolve. And I think the, you know, the best games that I've played are such an amazing match of those two things, of my skills actually evolve as a character and a player in the game as the game world evolves around it. That's a, a really skilled balance for people to nail. It's not easy. So thus, would you say that you're, you have a favorite genre, open world RPG type games? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a probably a little bit funny that way because I am very much a control player, meaning I love mm -hmm. the way games feel when they feel right. Um, and, and then once I get that feel, I want to be in a world that I find compelling, but I probably approach games in that order mm -hmm. that if the, if I feel like I'm fighting control and it's not necessarily the fault of the game, it's usually the fault of the player for me at least. Um, but if I feel like the controller is, is my barrier to progressing in a game, my ability to, to control, um, I will lose kind of interest in the game pretty quickly just for me. Um, so the games that I really love are first kind of starting with how I feel playing and then an interesting world. And it takes me all over the place. Um, what's a game I'm playing right now? Um, I'm playing a Frostpunk right now, which I don't know if you've played Frostpunk. I haven't. No. Okay, so um, not a control game at all. It's kind of this survival RTS game. Um, uh, but the controls are actually done in a fairly interesting way, ways that you control the world. But then it's set in this post-apocalyptic frozen world where you're a small out cropping of, of people trying to live around this big coal burning furnace in the middle of town. And, um, but I, I like the world. Um, and so that's one where I, I kind of got interested as the, as, as the controls were matching to me, but it's not about, okay, it has to be an FPS or it has to be, um, you know, a platforming game. I, I kind of start with just, does the control feel right in my hands? Do I feel like the controls go out of the, I mean, you're a, a great designer, you know, this, that the number one job is for the controller to go away and the relationship between what happens on screen and what happens in my heart and my mind is seamless um, and the controls just like when i'm typing like if you ask me where the w key is on a keyboard i kind of have to type out a word that has w because i don't you don't memorize the controller you don't memorize input um, you want it to to go away um, and and just become a seamless interface to what's going on on screen and that's that's where i start finding games i i really haven't heard anybody enunciate that as well as you just did. And, and I think that's a really important point for designers to keep in mind because we do, we talk about control all the time, right? When we're making games, but we don't think about it being invisible. We talk about camera maybe being invisible, but yeah. not necessarily just losing the idea that there's a control in your hand, controller in your hand, right? Yeah. And that, that seems, especially as we move into, you know, a new, potentially a new generation of interfaces. Yeah. Uh, even more important. Yeah. I think the, the canvas for how people are going to control games going forward, where the line between where you play a game um, and the input on that device is getting blurry. You know, if you look at massively successful game like Fortnite, what device does is Fortnite played on? The answer is kind of yes. Um, our own, you know, Minecraft. Where's Minecraft played? It's played everywhere. Where's Roblox played? It's played everywhere. And I think uh, just to, to kind of center in on Fortnite, I think one of the great things that Epic did more than the, the way they're kind of growing their world and the events and all of that stuff to me is people can play Fortnite on a Switch, they can play it on keyboard and mouse, they can play it on touch, um, and people have a great time. It's not to say it's the exact same game or the exact same feeling everywhere you play, but that's such a hard task to actually, I mean, you know this, to take a game that maybe was designed for a certain input paradigm uh, and fairly seamlessly and in that same way making it go away, allow millions, millions of people, definitely in the case of Fortnite, tens of millions of people to be playing with an input mode modality that wasn't how the game was originally designed to go play and pulling that off at the level of success that they have. I think that skill tree right there for designers on how we go nail that. It's something we're spending a lot of time on um, inside of, of Microsoft just as we go forward, both on kind of the plastic side of it, of different kind of controllers that might get docked to different things, um, but also even looking at touch and, and other um, ways for people to control games. And it's, I think we have a long journey there. Well, just on that topic, you guys have been leading the way in terms of creating more accessible controllers, right? You're, you're the 
adapt the, the new controller that you guys put out a couple of years ago, yeah. right, was groundbreaking. And is I think, been setting a great example for the rest of the industry for how to broaden the appeal. I mean, I, how, how did that come about? Thanks. Yeah, the Xbox Adaptive Controller um, was very much a grassroots thing that our, our teams... It started every year, once a year, Microsoft, all of Microsoft comes together for one week. And it, that's the term. It's not one week. It is one week, but it's also called one week. Um, and it's a giant hackathon across the whole company. And you vote with your feet in terms of the things that you want to work on. It doesn't have to be in the team that you're on. So some of the teams are created with coworkers, but a lot of them are just somebody's walking around in a big tent with a sign that says, hey, I want to work on X. And if somebody's interested, um, they go join that team. And the Xbox Adaptive Controller came out of that effort. Um, so we had people from all over the company, hardware engineers, software engineers, just people who wanted to help coming together when, we st when that Adaptive Controller started. Um, it was called something different back then. It had a code name, Zephyrus. And, uh, and then they, they won one week, that design. So it kind of comes through. And there are a few winners um, that come through where the company then says, hey, let's go try to make something of this. Uh, some of the things are further out, so they'll take longer to incubate. And that was one then us as a gaming leadership team, as the Xbox leadership team, it obviously came to us. Some of the members of the team were game team members, but some weren't. Uh, and we were trying to think about, well, how do you green light something like that? We've never built something like that. And the first thing that we did, and it was really team led, was go and talk to a lot of the companies that are out there already in that space so that we could get feedback from people who were already building accessories and wounded warriors and a lot of these other groups out there who were living day to day. How do you allow more people to go play? Um, and what do we have to think about um, as we, we go put that out? And one of the things that was important was price point. Um, that the getting into that space with a lot of the bespoke stuff was created at the time was incredibly expensive. Um, so we said, okay, how can we get out sub hundred dollars with the thing? And, um, and then we want early on, we made the decision. We want it to be completely open. We didn't want it to be an Xbox thing. Um, we didn't want it to be closed. And then one of the most heartwarming and I even get emotional thinking about it. I don't know if you've seen this video. It came out in the last month of this father in the UK who use the adaptive controller with the switch to allow his daughter for the first time to play uh, Zelda. And it's just, you see her smile. Um, you could probably link to the tweet or something um, in the notes, but it is amazing to see her light up and get to control Zelda. And he's built this, I mean, our small adaptive controller is such a small part of the equation of what he's built. Um, but everybody should play. And I, I believe that playing video games is innately good. And uh, the more people play, I think the, the better it is for all of us. Does that permeate the organization in terms of not just controlling games, but uh, features within games? I mean, has, has Microsoft made a bigger and bigger effort within studios to be a leader in terms of the, the features games provide? Yeah, I probably, um, I, I probably take a step back on the word leader. I think what we want to be is a catalyst for the conversation. Yeah, I think that's you know, a Great way to put it. I mean, yeah. we're all in this together, right? That's I right. Think. That's right. You know, um, and I, I think now you know, we have a large enough first party organization that the decisions that we make and being public about those decisions can be light posts for other people as they're making their decisions yeah. and building their games. Uh, I think as an industry, we've got a long way to go. I think gaming is a leader here. Um, I've said it before that um, I'll, I'll pick Minecraft just because we're so close to it. I think about how many kids have their first online social interaction in a game like Minecraft and what can we do as an industry to set some of those social norms early on? Because we've seen pockets of the Internet that can turn into very toxic places um, when the, with that online community. And I'm not going to dictate what everybody can say online or what what they can do online, but for at least the stuff that we can touch. I love the idea that us as an industry, because we, we know the demographic of people who want to play, um, that we can play a role in setting those social norms early on. And certain people will deviate from them and go do their own thing, and they should have places to go do those things. But I love us as an industry, our ability. We're this unique intersection of art and, and science and, and social. And there are very few other forms of entertainment that have that all three of those things coming together as tightly as we do. And I just love being at the center of that as part of this industry. And in places like Dice, I love the conversations that we have um, about our both responsibility and opportunity there. I, I agree. I mean, this is a place where people talk openly about how we can be good. Yeah. Right. And how we can take the art and, and the craft and make people's lives better and more positive. 
So do you think there's anything that mechanically or more practically we can do as sort of quasi competitors within the industry to come together and make more progress in general about accessibility, about promoting uh, less toxicity, uh, more diversity? What, what are things that we, we could be doing better as a group? Well, one, I'm, I'm very happy with the progress that we all have made jointly. And uh, whether it's uh, the other platform holders, Sony, Nintendo, even Stadia, we've had conversations, or the big publishers uh, <clears throat> and the different groups kind of hosting conversations for us to talk about what we could do better. I mean, to me, one of the things that I think I used to love about Dice, and I don't see it as much anymore. And you know, we should, we should that means we should be vocal with, with Megan and the team about how we continue to make progress. I think even and you did this, if I'm thinking back in the day, of kind of doing the post mortem on a big game or a big experience, and what did we learn? And it wasn't always pretty. Yeah, you know, standing up and being unafraid to talk about what went well, where you thought you were going to go, and where you landed. And maybe now in today's world of games, as as, as you're aware that the, that launch day in, in so many ways now is the beginning of the journey, not the end of the journey. Um, now <laughs> it feels like, okay, that's the time when the work really starts piling on. So maybe even like six months after a game's come out, having somebody at these forums kind of talk about what they're learning. We don't, we don't do as much of that as an industry as I think we used to. GDC has turned into something that's um, more commercial, which I get it. Like, you know, we have to go do those things. I think this kind of conference where it's smaller, there isn't a camera necessarily on you the whole time. So you're not, you're not thinking about, okay, how do I do PR while I also do my postmortem? I think we could do more of that and talk about the learnings that we've haven't had in a public way. I haven't seen us do much of that. Yeah. I, personally, I don't know if it's a reluctance to do it on the part of developers. It's more that to, to your point, we always are on the go, yeah. right? And it just takes a reminder that, hey, it's actually a great thing to be able to stand up and talk about what went well, what didn't go well, what we wish could have been better yeah. during development. And I remember seeing Todd Howard give yeah. a fantastic talk here awesome. yeah. about that. Yeah. And I just don't think that we have made it a point to ask, but I don't believe any developer today would be reluctant to get up and talk about those things because we're doing it internally all the time. That's right. And there's no problem. I also feel like in the sharing culture that we have, while there are there are certainly some barriers to what we can say in terms of confidentiality for future projects, I don't think there's been really any restriction in, in, from our perspective about what we can talk about that happened in the past. Yeah, I haven't heard that either. And I think you're right that um, I, I'd say now what I sense is it happens in the halls, like even you and I, before we started this, like right. we started on, hey, what's it like to integrate studios? Like, you know, those conversations um, happen. I think from the outside, sometimes people don't realize how small this industry is True. in terms of the number of teams and people. Um, and we all know each other and we've known each other for quite a while. And we're totally open to having conversations. I mean, in, I was in Starbucks this morning. I'm sitting in line and next to me is Graham Devine, somebody I've literally known for 20 years. Yeah. And we're having a conversation about stuff that he's working on now. And he's asking me about how the Xbox launch stuff's going. And it's those conversations happen. Um, I, and I think you're right. It's, it's, there's no barrier to it. I think it's just, let's, and maybe shame on me. Like I can, I can go do this, right? I can, any of us can go and say, Hey, this is something that we found valuable. But as I, I look at it, that that's, you know, it was a good question on what do I think we could do more of? And I think this industry is growing fast enough. If you go to the financial side of it and you say, okay, this is a, over a hundred billion dollar business. It's growing double digits every year in terms of users and monetization. Um, it's a business that's, that has a ton of room to grow as more and more people can find access to the great content that people um, in our industry are building. And I just love that us as, as an industry, we can continue to be leaders um, based on all the learning that we've had of how we, how we started from that Pong days to today. And when I make statements, even like who I see as the competition and who I don't see as the competition, I would much rather see companies that have been part of bringing the games industry to where it is today be leaders for the next 20 or 30 years. Because there's a learning um, and a responsibility that those teams have held for a long time that have brought us to this point. And I think that learning and understanding and responsibility should be part of gaming's next 50 years. And I, I, I'm, 
I like to find ways to, to partner. And yes, there's certain times where healthy competition also breeds um, best outcomes. Um, but I, I look at the more we can be open handed with each other and, and transparent about what we're trying to make happen. Um, and I think that's a, a big opportunity for us. Well, certainly, too, it, it helps educate the folks who are just getting out of school now who want to go into games. That's and right. I think what I find, at least, is that a lot of people come into the industry with uh, preconceived notions about what what it's like to yeah. be part of a developer or part of a publisher and usually they're way off. Yeah. And I feel like that's our fault Yeah, because we haven't been as open as we should about what it's like with some, and especially the negative side. Yeah. What are we, what are the challenges that we're constantly facing and how are we dealing with them and how are we failing yeah. to deal with them? That's right. Because I, it, I, I wish that had been in existence when you and I were yeah. getting into the industry. Cause yeah. I think we probably got in at about the same time. Yeah. And there was nothing. That's right. <laughs> nothing. That's right. I mean, yeah, I think for a lot of us, we fell into this industry because we like playing video games. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and that's, I think that's a great motivator, but it's it, it's not necessarily the skill tree that you need in order to succeed in this space. And it, now it kind of feels like outside looking in is where a lot of our negative kind of analysis comes from. Uh, and, and sometimes rightfully so. Yeah. Um, but I'd like us to be at the forefront of that as well. We want to talk about crunch. If we want to talk about, right. you know, game loops that are exploitive, if we, all these things, I'd much rather see us have an open conversation with each other um, about those opportunities and the positive. I'm, I'm probably more of a spotlight person than I am kind of a, here are the things that, that are going poorly, but you have to balance both sides of the scales in order to move it. I agree. I think, I think especially in today's society, folks, at least from my perspective, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cynicism that's just amplified by everything that's available online. And to be, to sort of a, a, attack that cynicism in an authentic way, you really have to be transparent. That's and, right. And that's like, if, you, if we're just completely one-sided either way, uh, o- way, way overly positive or overly negative. And that's exactly right. Introspective. It doesn't work that well. You lose objectivity. And like I said, I think one-to-one we do. I, we started talking about D&D. I played in the Dice D&D tournament last night, um, which three full tables, uh, Wizards of the Coast ran it, ran it. It was fantastic. What, what an awesome opportunity, right? I mean, <laughs> it was great. I, I mean, they have Wizards of the Coast running it. I know. It was great. Yeah. yeah. And like real DMs actually know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and I was sitting next to Amy Henning, who's a great friend of mine who I've known for a long time. Uh, but we're sitting next to each other for like three and a half hours while we're playing um, and succeeding. And uh, But... <laughs> You can imagine the conversation, it's not just between Amy and I, but when you're sitting next to each other for that long and you're talking about, you know, she's starting something new and where she's going, that the conversation is balanced. It's like, hey, here are the things we wish there was more of. Here are the things we wish there was less of. Here's what it feels like to start something. Here's what it feels like to be running something that's you know, two decades. And those conversations that you and I have together in that room, Jade Raymond was there, Harold Ryan was there. I mean, it was a room full of, of, of people who love playing video games, um, love being in the industry. And those kind of open, balanced discussions do happen. And I think the more public we are, the more we own the opportunities that we see. So it's not some senator or somebody at the EU or somebody in the press who feels like they're kind of pointing out something that we're trying to hide. Uh, I think it's just better for us to be transparent. There's, when we say there, when I, we say there's social responsibility in uh, the social aspects of gaming, we have to also say there's negative aspects to the social side yeah. of gaming, and they're real, and we have to tackle those. Uh, and we, you can't just spotlight the the kind of Twitter girl playing Zelda with the adaptive controller. You also have to talk about the stuff that that we want to go work on, and we've got to be open about both of those. I think it's a great point. So, so speaking of just conversations. Uh, I want to go back to Microsoft a little bit. You guys have grown significantly in terms of the games division with a lot of new companies that you've brought into the fold. How has that affected your culture, if at all? Definitely has. I mean, in fact, when Matt Booty and I were talking about this, I think if it doesn't affect our culture, we're failing at it. Like the, it's, it's funny. I report now to a person named Satya Nadella, who is the CEO of Microsoft and I can understand at the Microsoft level, and I don't think it's specific to Microsoft when there's, whatever, 130,000 people at the company where you want to have a Microsoft culture. Um, And I, in the end, I think when you have 130,000 people, you don't really have a culture. It's too big. Uh, I think you have some principles and ground rules 
that say, here's how we're going to engage. Here are the assumptions that we're going to make of teams. If you're at different parts of the company and you come together, like here's, here's the way we, here's what we can expect from each other. But it's, you also quickly understand you are a culture of cultures hmm. and that's nowhere is that more true than in studios. Um, one, cause the geodiversity of the studios, they don't all live under one roof and it feels different to live in Montreal than it does in Limington spa than it does in Santa Monica. And the teams that you will attract will have different lived experiences. And you actually want those to impact those differences to impact the strategy of, of the organization at the D and D last night, Fergus was there and, and running obsidian, one of the new teams that have joined. And it's really interesting for me to talk to somebody like Fergus, who's run obsidian for so long so successfully about what is he feeling as he's coming into this organization and what about obsidian is going to imprint on who we are um, and then th almost by necessity the flow well you're going through this right now you, you're, you're an expert at this that the flow will go in both directions yeah. but it's when matt and i talk about it is how do we foster a culture of cultures where we have kind of baseline expectations of each other um, and we understand how we're going to interact, but at the same time, I don't want everybody to feel like they work in the same studio or everybody, um, is, is part of the Xbox platform team or something. I want those cultures to maintain. And I think we're on that journey. I don't think we have it necessarily right. Um, uh, but we're always learning and listening. And it most important thing is those leaders and those teams that have come in feel like they have a voice and a, and a platform to stand on, to let the organization know how how it's going and how they're feeling. So uh, maybe you can't answer this, but how does that work? Yeah, what, I'll try to do it quickly. You know, if I go through our history in studio acquisitions back when it was Microsoft Game Studios, you know, we have some real poor learning experiences, things like, you know, Bungie, which I love, I love the acquisition of Bungie, Bungie but we moved them all in from Chicago to, to Redmond because all the studios kind of had, had to be in the same place except for a couple of them. If you even go back to like FASA, we, we acquired FASA and we actually took the organization apart. We put all the developers in our studios, developers org and all the producers, like literally, um, kind of restructured that whole team. And if you look at our evolution, then, then Ensemble, then things like Lionhead and Rare, we kept them where they were. And even there was learning experiences through all of those. Um, so some of where we are now and how we do it is lived experiences through things that haven't gone as well for us in terms of integration. And regretfully, that's a way humans learn. Um, and I say how we do it now, um, Matt's very good about getting the teams together um, and having real open public conversations. The cool thing now, um, and I'm, I'd be interested in, I'm sure at, at Sony it's similar. Um, when the studio organization gets to a certain scale, you can almost have like your little mini dice um, with your own teams. And that's something that I, I really see now. The amount of sharing that's going on um, between the different teams at the or inside of, of the Xbox Game Studios is just awesome. I was down at the initiative a couple weeks ago and, and, and playing a game and they were talking about what they had talked to Ninja Theory about and what they had talked to the coalition about and what code they were actually using um, in the stuff that we were playing from those different teams and control, going to control all that stuff. So um, I think just building the forum and the platform for those things, but listening is the most important thing because teams either overtly or covertly will tell you uh, when things aren't going quite well. And we just have to be an organization of leaders that listens. I think that's that's great. And I'd say it's also reflected at Sony. Great. I mean, since since we became a part of Sony, it Congrats has been, on that, by the way. Thank you. It's, yeah. it's been a lot of it's been great for the team. And and moreover, it's been wonderful to be able to reach out to all the other teams, yeah. which we used to do anyway. Yeah. But to feel even more welcome. So there's no problem just talking completely openly about the pluses and minuses and things that are not going well and yeah. how other teams maybe have solved the same problem. Yeah. I think the next step, the next step, which would be exciting in our in both of our fantasy worlds, is to to cross the lines between giant organizations. Yeah. Right? We should be talking to the initiative, yeah. right? I mean, we've got friends over at the initiative yeah. and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, it'd be great to talk to Stadia developers. Yeah. I mean, there's so much that we share in terms of of challenges that have nothing to do with the technology and have nothing to do with the platforms we're on. That's right. right. It's about it's about culture. It's about creating great places to work. All those things are the same exact, um, generally present the same issues for us.
So if we're all about making the industry a better place, we should be able to have out, open conversations outside of things like DICE and GDC. Yeah. And, you know, probably make you a little uncomfortable. One of the cool things about this podcast that I've seen you do is I've been listening to it is you get real people, you get people with real experience um, and you know, people who I'm in awe of and I think about their creative capability. I can you know, barely write my name and I see people <laughs> that can go and um, create real, real worlds and, and, and they're very open. And I love that you've built this, this forum here to sit there and listen to people and because people are very open with you. I remember like listening to the conversation you had with Vince, which I thought was just awesome. And Vince is somebody I've known for a long time, really a great guy. But to see him be public about the, the learning experiences. I mean, this is one I would say for you at some point in the next three or four months, they should flip the microphone on you. <laughs> now to talk about the experience for Insomniac and Sony, because that's, yeah. and, and maybe, you know, we, we could have Fergus or somebody on and talk about, well, what does it mean to be running a successful independent studio for such a long time? And all of the, uh, the, the kind of learning and struggle and successes that have, have been part of that and, and how is it different? Oh, that's a really good idea. And there, there are probably several studios who would have a lot to say about that yeah. if we focus on that particular topic. And it, I think it's relevant to, to anybody who is starting a game company, who is part of a game company in mid-growth, or yeah. just because that is a generally a potential endpoint. Not endpoint, but maybe even a starting point if you want to call that's it right. that. That's becoming right. Becoming part of a larger organization. Yeah. So I, would, I wish... I have been able to talk to people ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, but not that anything's gone poorly because it's been great. Yeah. Um, it's a great idea. So hopefully we can do that. Um, so I, I want to keep on going sort of on the Microsoft side and, and talk a little bit about what you have been talking about publicly. And that is where Microsoft is going mm -hmm. with the Xbox One X, with uh, xCloud, with Game Pass. And in particular, the thing that's I think we talk a lot about it in Insomniac is very mechanical, but important is monetization. And, and what I'm interested in is whether or not we are still sort of at the wild west phase where anything goes with so many different types of monetization, <laughs> yeah. or if we are sort of in the middle part of this pattern where there are a couple of proven paths for monetization and things probably won't change very much. Maybe there'll be some experiments or if we're completely locked in, it's yeah. all going to be subscription in the future or, or $60 games or something. Yeah. Where do you think we are on that spectrum? Well, first thing I, I would say just on the last point is our point of view as Xbox Microsoft is that there's not kind of one business model to rule them all. And we actually think it's healthy, not only for our industry from a monetization standpoint, but also from a creative standpoint, if multiple business models will work. And what's a good example? I don't know if I was just talking to Sam the other day. Maybe I'll use Alan Wake as an example. When we started on Alan Wake, we wanted to make it an episodic game. And in fact, if you play through the game, you can actually kind of see the structure of the episodes in the game. You know, it's about an author writing a book, like it, the chapters, it all kind of made sense. And we all at the end of it got a little, um, I'll say scared about whether episodic was going to work in that world. How the business model works, you see, you sell X number of units for one, X divided by two is episode two. And it's kind of this diminishing, we've all looked at that model and said, okay, we're going to bundle it all up. It's going to be $60. Was it better or worse? I don't know. But the fact that we were so set in that world, and I put that on the publisher, not on the developer, that there was a business model. It was called a shiny disc on the shelf and it was $60, you know, locked us in to certain, really what I would call creative decisions. Mm -hmm. So I think for us as an industry, we should embrace monetization dexterity for us um, because I think it leads to the best creativity. I don't think we've reached the end of how we see people. And when, when I think about monetization, I really think about how I acquire the ability to play. And it's a little bit weird sounding. But uh, so last May, I was in Africa uh, and we were opening a couple of development centers as Microsoft in Africa. And I'm the sponsor for those. So I, I go and I talk to the teams and they have a model in Africa, and it's probably not just in Africa, of basically earning credit that they can use to use the internet. So you might watch an ad, you might be on a taxi, on a bus, um, you watch an ad, it gives you five minutes of value now to go in and browse the open internet. And you think of it as kind of pay to earn or play to earn, where I'm actually earning kind of stored currency through things that I realize other people are monetizing and showing me ads or whatever it might be. Um, and I, I said, 
could that be a model that works in games? Well, absolutely. I think it could. Yeah. Right. And um, I don't know if it's going to completely mirror the business models that we have today. It'll probably, it's not necessarily free to play. It's not necessarily ad funded. It's somewhere, it's something different. Yeah. But I think as we reach new pockets of the planet with new players, with their own kind of lifestyles and monetization and, 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 and kind of the, the amount of cash flow they want to apply to gaming, we as an industry should be flexible in thinking about people play. You look at PC cafes around the world, so successful in so many places where you go in and you, play, you pay by the hour on, on how often I should play. We should open up those opportunities for our content. More people to play, I think, is a good thing. Um, we have to be careful because like, I think if, if you view the gaming world as a fixed pie, if you say there are 200 million people that will buy a gaming console in any generation, which is about the number, and in order to grow the business, we need to get more per user, and that's the only path to growth for the business where it's a fixed number of players and it's just how much you monetize each hour or each minute somebody is playing. I think that's dangerous for us as an industry. So I think we need to find new players and new ways of monet new forms of monetization to open up those new player bases and the, kind of new ways to build games, new creativity. Um, and that's a great path to growth. Um, and I, I worry sometimes that a, a fixed mindset and like fighting the cannibalization. The number of times I'm sitting with a publisher and they say, well, I don't want to take, I don't want to take any risk with today's business model, but I want to try the next, a new business model. It, it's such an innovator's, innovator's dilemma, right? It is the classic, somebody else is going to exercise that new business model if you don't. So let's go try some stuff to, together and go learn together. But no, I think we got a long way to go as we, as we find more and more players. So I, how do you break through that mentality? So you, you mentioned that, you will talk to people who have sort of this fixed idea or fixed mental image of what is possible and what is impossible. And I think monetization and what you saw in Africa is an excellent example of just an orthogonal way of thinking yeah. about things. When you talk to people who are making the calls in studios at other publishers, what do you say? What's your technique to help them to say yes and versus no, but yeah, I don't know if I'm good at it. Like that's one where, and, and I don't want to make it seem like I'm somehow the enlightened one and, and I, I've seen all the future. Like I, there are a lot of fixed, what we would call at Microsoft fixed mindset views that I have on things. So I, I'm, I'm on this journey like all of us. One of the reasons that we've invested more heavily in our first party is because we, we know that content is the thing that, that drives engagement. It's what people play. They play games. They don't play pieces of plastic plugged into their televisions. They don't play bits flying over the internet. They play the game. They yeah. play what they feel and what they see. Um, so one of the things we can do with a larger first party organization is take the risk on our own. Mm. We can do things like shipping our games day and date on both PC and console at the same time. Um, we can give you an entitlement across both of those things and as opposed to having you buy the game on PC and buy the game on console. Um, we can push on things like cross save and cross progression. And, um, and those things have been great. Like I've seen the industry move forward, sometimes faster than us, sometimes with us as part of it. Um, and so one of the things for us is to go do what we are espousing. Like we are trying to get people to, to try new things. Well, let's go do that with our own content, the subscription. We're going to put our games in day and date in the subscription. So in particular, I wonder about that. So having your first party AAA games as part of Game Pass, yeah. right? How does that work? Can that work financially? And I, I ask this because we've certainly talked about it and I'm sure, sure a lot of other developers have too, because it's fantastic to have your game exposed to so many people immediately who yeah. can just to because through a subscription can play your game. Yeah. But does that make how does that make financial sense? Yeah, I mean not not to be weird about it. You and I have had this exact same conversation. <laughs> <laughs> in yeah. the past. Yeah. Um and you know, it's uh it doesn't make financial sense. Um it does, but like I don't know, like that's just me. It's like some dude saying, "Yeah, it does." If it if you play it out and you say we can get more people playing more games and more hours. Um, I think that's a great thing for industry. And what I see today in the Game Pass subscription, and uh, these are all kind of PR things that people have heard from me before, but people play significantly more games than they've ever played before. The thing that probably makes me the happiest is they play more genres mm. than they would ever play. They might come in because 
um, Sunset Overdrive PC is in PC Game Pass or something like, you know, and um, I mean, even doing Sunset Overdrive on PC was something we didn't do originally together. Right. And we were able to do later. It was great to be able to bring that game to more players. And it's kind of in that same vein. If we can bring a game that people might have interested interest in, but to more players and lower the friction, um, is that a good thing? I think it is. Game Pass as a business works today. Um, and will definitely work as it continues to grow. And the most important thing to me is, and I got actually mail this morning from a couple, uh, a dev that had just put two games into Game Pass on how much more exposure, and for them monetization, because they have a business model inside of the game that's working. But for our games, you know, we're, we're gonna take, um, we're gonna be bold with the decisions that we make with our content and where we think the, the flow can go. And I love the fact that people in Game Pass play more games than they ever would, that the, the kind of, incremental cost of clicking on the next game and trying it is zero yeah. for people. And then when they find a new genre, a new developer that they love, they tend to go and invest in that genre and that developer. Even if the games aren't in Game Pass, they'll go buy those games um, and go invest more time and money in that. The thing that we're actually cannibalizing now, funny enough, as we look at the math, we say, if people are playing more games and they're playing for more hours, what's going down? It's actually TV time. Hmm. <laughs> so as we're doing the analysis right now, the thing that Game Pass is actually eating into more than anything on our platform um, is the TV time that people, because they're they're more willing to go and try the new thing, A Plague's Tale or something that they maybe they wouldn't have gone and played, um, but some really great stories. Um, and I love that. That's really nice to hear, actually. Our industry is winning. Like yeah. That. You know, I don't have any hate on TV. I don't watch a lot of TV, but uh, I do think that, that gaming, like I said, because of its interactive nature and social nature has some unique capabilities. And um, that's what we're seeing today. But it is, I mean, like I say, you and I've had this real time conversation around us working together and there, there is, it's not without tension. It's not without risk um, to go try these things. And we'll definitely try things that don't work. Um, I have, you know, my long list of those things. Um, and, but if I'm always learning, yeah. And we're always trying to go forward together as an industry. I think it's a good thing. Well, speaking of big risks and big bets, xCloud. Yeah. Right? And uh, you've talked a lot about that, <laughs> which is fantastic. And I think that all of us in the industry have, have learned that Microsoft is very, very serious about a cloud-based future for games. So do you think, and this is sort of a clickbait type statement, that we are moving from console wars to cloud wars? I hope not, because the wars part of it is just a part that uh, I, I try to avoid. Right. Um, but I do think the getting to a, a world where you don't have to own one device to play specific games helps the industry. And not everybody believes that. They yeah. get that. That doesn't mean that owning a device isn't part of my gameplay experience. I think I'm going to have a game console plugged into my television for the next decade plus. Like sure. I think it's going to be the best way for me to play on my television is to have a local device, download the game and play. Uh, but sometimes I'm not in front of my television. Right. Sometimes I'm not in front of a device that has the native capability to play. And that's our bet on cloud, our bet on cloud. And the nice thing is, I mean, you see what Google's doing. You see NVIDIA just came out of, of their, their beta with, with GeForce Now and Jensen and the team have done a great job with that. Um, there are a lot of companies out there that are learning PSN now. Like there's, uh, we're all kind of learning on, on what it means to, I call it kind of liberate content from one specific device. Um, and there's a, a ton of, a ton of learning both on, on business model creativity input, um, that, that we'll need to go through for us. We really do mean it when we say when everybody plays, we all win. Yeah. Like we mean that. And, um, if you want to play on your television, we're going to go build a great console for people to go play on. If you want to play on your PC, we want to let you play there. And the cloud is really a means to an end. And that end is more people can engage in the great content that teams like yours build. Do you think that there are lessons that developers need to be aware of now as they are starting to think about cloud content? Something, a game that runs with kind of quote unquote infinite GPU power. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the most valuable thing for us to date has been handing developers their own game on a phone. And just, and this is what we started on early. The reason we put servers in Japan, we put servers in Korea, we put servers in, in England, servers here, is so we could go into a developer 
and just hand them their own game. And it was you know, amazing how quickly developers, uh, creators will instantly pick up on the big things and the little things that, you know, some of the little things like font size and, um, and even like screen brightness and like some, these are just such tactical kind of in the weeds blocking and tackling things on what does it mean when you're, de when you were designing for what you assumed was kind of a, a, a large DPI screen and where fonts were going to show up well, and then you shrink everything down. What does that mean? But then once you kind of get through the pragmatics of, okay, how do I make this playable um, on that, on that screen, then you get to the promise that you start talking about of, well, wait a minute. Now, if my game isn't just dependent upon this one piece of hardware that somebody maybe bought five years ago, that's in the home, but actually something that a large cloud provider is updating on the back end and is scalable, then what can I do with our games? And, you know, there's companies like CCP that have been out there for a while that have been doing some cool work in this space. We've tried a couple things. And I think as an industry, we've got, um, that is like that, that's a very cool future yeah. um, up and down of how do we scale the cloud compute capability to the creative experience that somebody wants to deliver. Well, going back to the financial question though, this is sort of a wonky question. When you have the opportunity to create a game that uses a crazy number, a crazy amount of compute and GPU resources that can, a lot of developers that I talk to start going, wait a second, how can that make financial sense? Yeah. And do you think that there's a, a, a coming divide between say players who are willing to pay you know, a premium for that? I mean, for, Stadia is a good example, yeah. right? They have their, their different levels. Yeah. Uh, is that, do you think that's one potential cloud feature? Uh, to be honest with you, we're less focused today on, you know, 8K, 120 hertz from the cloud. Like I think we'll, or even, you know, scalable uh, physics architecture, scalable right. AI in the cloud. We're more focused on how we take the thousands of games that already run and deliver those to more people while keeping sight lines. And maybe that makes us more backward looking. So, because you're right, like whether the, the silicon sitting underneath your television or sitting in the cloud, it costs money. Yeah. Uh, and if you use three or four consoles to deliver experience to someone, you're either renting it on some kind of cloud-based model or you bought all four of them or stuck them under your TV and Daisy Jane <laughs> together some way. So the, the economic question will have to get answered. Um, you're absolutely right. And it's why for us right now, it has really been a focus on the content that people are building today mm -hmm. and how we deliver while we keep a, kind of a point of view on where things are going, but it, it is, there's a lot of structural things to work through. Like you said, in terms of cost access, you know, just thinking about it, I probably think about it a little bit of the way I think about PC today, where I can go out and buy a thousand dollar plus GPU and go throw it in my PC. And I'm going to have a different experience than somebody who has a three-year-old laptop who's playing the same game. The cost basis to play those two games is different. One of them I've decided through retail that I'm going to go buy uh, the GPU on my own and put it in, and um, and and that's how I've kind of strided the world. And and as a creator, you know, you have both of those customers. You have somebody that's going to be playing your game at 1080p, and you've got somebody who's going to be playing your game at 144 hertz or something. And those um, you have to build a consistent experience for both of those players. And it's part of the world we live in. Um, I. You focus on that high-end customer, not because that's where most of the players are, but it's usually a very good customer. So you focus on them. Plus it gives you kind of those sparkly things to go demo and show. And it, it gets people's imagination running, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we're already kind of spanning uh, capabilities of our player base. And I think it, it, we will end up in that same space in the cloud. Uh, at some point for us, it is right now a focus on just you know, how can people play Sunset Overdrive um, when they don't own an Xbox or a PC and they want to go play? Um, and uh, and that we just have a lot of room to go in, in that space. And that's where most of our focus is. That makes sense. And I appreciate you bringing up Sunset Overdrive. It was it, a fun it, game to work on. That was a blast <laughs> working together on that. Uh, well, I, the just one more question on sort of the console at cloud yeah. future. You mentioned that you believe you always have a console under your TV. Yeah. Right. As... What do you think the future is for consoles? When you look down the road, say ten years from now, yeah, which might be a generation and a half away from from where we are today, what will your console look like? What is it going to be? What do you want it to be? Yeah, that's great. I think we're going to end up with more differences underneath um, our TVs than we did before. I Meaning, I do think there's probably a, a plethora of, of streaming only consoles that mm. don't have um, a, don't have a disc drive, don't have a local even storage device. 
um, and everything's coming through and it's how do I get that signal to the television? Maybe some of those are built in. Um, I think you'll see more high end stuff as well because, you know, the, I just look around me and I try to pattern match on things. And if I think about video and if I think about music, um, the streaming services that are out there have liberated those, the, those, those media types to all the devices around me. I now have way more devices than I've ever had to watch TV. Um, with the advent of Disney and Netflix and everybody else coming in, um, it hasn't lessened the number of devices. It's actually increased it. Same thing with music. Now, I, you know, I have Spotify in my ear. I have Spotify in my pocket. I have, you know, my in my home. I've got I've got the ability to go connect to my music services across so many different devices with different levels of fidelity, yeah. um, large screen, small screen, uh, stereo sound. Sometimes I'm listening to music with one earpiece in, right? And I think games are are gonna go. It's gonna go similar. I think what we're gonna find is as games are able to run in multiple contexts and different devices. Um, you're going to see a lot of different devices grow up to support sus different use scenarios. And underneath my television, I think I, what I, one of the things I, it's always bummed me out about console is I usually have one TV in my house that a console is plugged into. Yeah. It's very much a multi-TV thing kind of bubble world that we live in where we might have multiple TVs in our house. But the idea that I can't just go to any TV in my house and sit down and play the games that I want to go play um, we should have that ability. And as a model for us as an industry, we should think about how, yes, maybe one of them is the primary place where I play, where I have the most capability, but my ability to, to, to throw that content either from that one console or from the cloud to any of the TVs in my house um, is something that I think we should have. And I think helps us in terms of families playing together and, and just new creative scenarios. So I think we're going to see a multitude of different devices in my house that allow me to play. Um, that's what we're already seeing with the early xCloud you know, preview that we're in. I, the number of people who send me pictures of their Android tablets um, that they've mounted in certain places and have certain controls set up or people going out and buying specific devices so they can use remote play or you know different streaming uh, scenarios uh, from from their console to different screens. I, I think we're just early on in that journey, but it's uh, it's going to be fun. I agree. I, that's such a great vision, I think, that for the future for players. I mean, what's wonderful about it is it's not it's not driven by a, like a mega corporation who's out to make money. This is about the player experience. That's, that's what right. you're describing right player now. Player at the center has to be the key. Yeah, that's that's great to hear. I hope developers and publishers are listening closely to this. And it so, seems like they are. I'll yeah. say the conversations that we're having with whether it's the other platform holders, which you know, I, I know sometimes I make comments about who's my competition and who's not. You know, it, for me, it's really about people that today have large gaming audiences and customers. And I find my conversations with those other companies are usually more collaborative than, you know, two may enter, one may leave scenarios. So in that world, I'd love the industry to find a way to continue to evolve through both competition and cooperation. We should compete in the areas that help us both get better and where the, the winner is the, the, the team that does the best job um, at putting the customer at the center and delivering the right experience. Um, and and I, I love the brands that are in the industry today and the safety that players have with those brands. And I think for us as an industry, it's great when all of those brands continue to grow. I agree. And I think that's a wonderful thought to, to end on. Uh, just, just one last personal question. Yeah. Um, as you think ahead to, well, actually, sorry, this is a question I've gotten from a lot of insomniacs. Uh, you are one of the most public and, and beloved figures in our industry. You really are. I mean, it's great that you get up on stage and you are supporting indie developers and you're always out there waving the flag for games that may not get the most recognition because they're smaller or they're doing something that's innovative and, and different. Thanks. How do you have time <laughs> to understand what even exists across the industry? How do you have time to play all these games? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, it, it's, it, it, ugh, how do I answer that one? One thing I'll say. Well, how do you make time? Because I know you yeah, do. That's the, yeah. I mean, when you and I were talking before this, you know, both my daughters are now in college. Um, my wife and I, uh, it's just us. We live together. My wife is my high school sweetheart. We've known each other forever. So we have a very great relationship. I don't watch a lot of TV. I play a lot. People can see I'm online when I play. Um, I read a lot of comics. You know, I, I'm... I am the luckiest person on the planet. Like I ended up in a job. I don't know what I would be doing if I didn't end up in this job because it's it's kind of what I was was meant to go do. I love 
being in a studio. I love coming and visiting teams, seeing their creative passion, playing the game with them. Um, I, I mentioned this, I was I was in Japan three weeks ago now, and I was with the PSO2 team. Um, and it's just a massive floor of people all working on this game. And you, you've been around this before, the energy of a team that comes together. So um, when I'm out there talking about um, games that I'm playing or things that I'm seeing, it really just comes from an awe of, of the team's capability to come together and get amazing things done. I think teams shipping games, uh, and I've said this before, is one of the most um, exposed things that people can do because you put it out there. I mean, let's talk about you and I with Sunset. You put it out there, um, it's going to get evaluated, graded. Um, there will be champions for it. There will be people who are anti-champions for it. And it can't defend itself. Yeah. You as the creator, you have to sit back and watch that. Um, we've seen creators try to go and defend their thing. Like it just, it, that doesn't end well. No. Um, it's, it's just very exposed and raw when a team is putting their, their energy and their creativity into something and putting it out for the world um, to go and experience. And I always think, I play so many games because I always, even the games that didn't necessarily work exactly right, didn't everything come, it didn't all come together the right way. Teams almost always start with the best intention of we're going to go do something remarkable, even if it's small or if it's large. So I love playing uh, because I've just been around that loop for teams so often. And I'm just, you know, I applaud every time any team ships something and put it out, puts it out there for somebody to play, whether it's Sony game, Nintendo game, an Xbox game, a Steam game, a Stadia game, you know, a VR game. I don't really care. Just the fact that creation continues to happen. Um, I just, I want to be a, an advocate for that because I think it's just an amazing thing for our industry. Well, thanks for doing that for our industry. It's, well, you're the one who's creating. So thank you for being a creator. <laughs> that's just yeah. awesome. Awesome. Well, if, if people want to ask you further questions, I know you're very active on Twitter. Yeah. Do you mind sharing your Twitter handle for people? Xbox P3 is uh, the Twitter handle. I'm P3 on Xbox Live and my parties are open a lot. So people will jump in uh, and play. Um, I even get a lot of email in my inbox. I can't always ex say that I'm, I'm able to answer everything uh, uh, timely. Um, but the engagement with the players, like I say, we, we have to put the player at the center. And that engagement's the, the most valuable thing to me being head of Xbox is the connection with the players that are out there. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for doing this. Thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.